Today I decided to test out this home decor folk art chalk paint. It was a little difficult to open, but once I finally got it open, I had to end up leaving and getting it open in a different room. As I said, it's really frustrating that that top part didn't open all at once. I mixed it together with this knitting needle because the bottle said it needed to be mixed and I made sure to use the paint that got on the knitting needle and fairly quickly, though I had some trouble opening these very difficult to open old Galleria tubes using my pliers, I was able to get three different phthalo greens to test. These acrylic paints are fairly shiny when they dry to very shiny, but once I mixed the chalk paint in, it turned into a pastel that was very matte. These tests were done on three different papers in order for me to check how this paint would work when mixed in with other paints. I bought the whitest white of the chalk paint options in order to use it as a base to get more gouache-like acrylic and to test out the chalk paint in general on different papers and other surfaces. The chalk paint is marketed for painting furniture to get interesting effects, weathering, and a milky surface. However, that doesn't mean that's all you have to use it for. As this one is acrylic based, I can use it like any of my acrylic paints and I can use it for various work. Here I am testing it out in my Little Dollarama craft toned paper sketchbook. I was careful to make sure to have everything be well organized while doing these tests so I make sure everything would be properly labeled and very clear. Later I'll show you the version once everything is fully dry. Doing tests like this will help you understand your own supplies in order to figure out how you're going to use them later. You can pre-plan and think about art projects and paintings you want to do and think about what things you already own. And having done tests on different paper and surfaces, you can use that information to inform how and what you're going to do. I end up going over the lashes for this eye here with black acrylic paint and not every paint color that I'm using to paint these eyes on the paper is going to have any of the chalk paint mixed in, but most of the lighter tones do. In order to test the mattifying abilities and the way that this paint works when mixed in with regular acrylics, I find it works almost identically to any regular acrylic paint I use and mixes in just fine. It dries very matte and fairly opaque, but it wasn't quite as opaque as I actually thought it would be. Still, it works quite well and I do think I'm going to get quite a bit of use out of it, although I'm not always going to pick it up and use it. I also did notice it seemed to have a little bit of fuminess to it more than my regular art acrylic paints, but only subtly more, so I advise well ventilated areas and perhaps leave the room while the stuff is drying and go outside or somewhere with good ventilation and don't spend too much time near it. But the fumes didn't really bother me that much and they were still quite subtle or possibly caused from something else I thought might have been the fumes. I can't be certain. I do think they might have a slight bit of fume or odor to them, but nothing particularly serious. The footage has been sped up quite a lot and highly edited. I did have additional things I painted I edited out because the video was too long and I changed the order of this video in order to show the different things in a more pleasing and logical order rather than jumping back and forth between the paper artwork and the other artwork you'll see later. So I decided to use this brown ballpoint pen to draw this eye just so I could test if I right away painted with acrylic on top would there be any smudging or interaction and it worked extremely fine. There was no smudging, it really was able to show the opacity of the paints really well and there was no negative interactions between ballpoint pens and this or regular acrylic paint which is an interesting thing to test out. Going forward I've learned that it's a really good technique to start with an underlayer of acrylic paint and once that's fully dry you can draw right on it with ballpoint pen and really quickly after that paint over it with acrylic paint. This is an interesting mixed media order that works quite well and would be something I'm going to use in future artworks as well, keeping it in mind. Now we'll take a closer look at the eye. In the last sketchbook, this is a low cost little white paper sketchbook that I got from a friend before. I'm using one of the earlier pages in the book I never quite filled in, which is a test page to do additional tests and painting this eye, this time using graphite. 
I used a lighter graphite HB pencil, just a cheap one, and sketched it in. I didn't put the eyelashes in because I knew I'd be painting those in with black acrylic paint. Sometimes you don't need to put everything in the sketch. If the pencil itself is going to be covered by the paint you're doing, only put in what you absolutely need as a guideline to yourself, particularly if the pencil you're laying down is not really meant to be seen in the final painting. So things like eyelashes don't need to be added until you add them in with the paint itself, but getting the shape of the eye and the positioning of features is something you would very much consider putting in in the pencil stage to help yourself. I was thinking about making these eyelashes look a little messier and more natural and doing all these eyes with similar colors but showing how they look different on different papers. Everything here is now fully dried and I don't know if it's picking up on camera well but without the chalk paint the original acrylic is quite shiny. This is an old vintage Batat collection Aranosaurus and a couple miniature pieces of furniture that I intend to test the paint on. The Uranosaur has been pre-cleaned with a scrubby brush and I've been intending to paint it better because I do not like the old coloration they gave this animal from the 90s at all. Let's do something much more realistic, shall we? I've been thinking about doing this for more than 20 years, so it's about time that this Uranosaur got a nice new coat of paint. I'm basing the coloration on what I know of animals that are similar to it, including the fossilized dinosaur mummy Brachylophosaurus, named Leonardo, which is somewhat of a relative, as well as things I know about colorations that dinosaurs could have and similar modern animals. I'm thinking of large antelopes in terms of what sort of coloration feels realistic for a large herbivore like this. For this base coat, I'm using two main colors and working them in wet and wet so that there's a slight blend to the edge between the colors. The underneath of the belly is more of a bright white and the top is more of a cream color. To avoid getting more paint on my hands and having to clean my hands off too much, I decided to start wearing protective gloves while working on things like this. If the paint gets a little smudged while I'm holding things, I'd still rather get it painted all at once and not waste any of the paint that's out. At some points, I put the model down in order to paint it so that I don't have to handle it in order to try to prevent getting as much paint on the gloves. I'm still trying not to get paint on myself, even if it's on the gloves, and I'm trying to work things out more logically and successfully. Some of the things that I do while working on this include making sure I mix additional colors in. They're a little off screen, but I brought in some brown tones in order to paint the furniture. Reddish browns and more dark browns, burnt umbers and burnt siennas. I mix it in with a little bit of the chalk paint as well. I'm trying to check the mattified qualities of the paint as well as just how opaque it is and how good it would work as a first coat or a primer. This miniature furniture already has a coat of gray primer on it, whereas some of the other ones I'm going to work on do not start with a coat of primer. This is me also testing the properties of the chalk paint to be a sort of primer in and of itself. This one here does not have any primer, it's just brown plastic. So how good does this chalk paint with a bit of a brownish tone mixed in function as a primer? I'm thinking that because it's quite opaque and because it's been advertised as not needing a primer coat underneath when used on furniture, that should also apply to miniature furniture, right? Well, checking it out, I think that's fairly true and that it can function as a primer. So moving forward, I'll keep that in mind when working on miniature furniture that I'm preparing for games such as Dungeons and Dragons. I carefully get in the nooks and crannies without obsessing over the very back. It's okay for the dark brown of the original plastic to show through where the shadows would be deep inside of this bookshelf so I don't overthink it too much. I switch between a smaller and a larger brush, whatever works easier for me. I'm trying to keep the brushes moist between and rinse them off in jars of water on the side so that the acrylic paint won't dry in the bristles and ruin the brush. I'm trying to be a little delicate here, but it is a little rough poking things in miniatures like this as well as using acrylic paint with brushes, so eventually bristles will get damaged. Going back to the Uranosaur, I mix almost the same colors I did last time, but with the addition of some darker brown tones in order to put a base coat for some stripes I want to add to the model. 
I think about it for a moment and then get going. A little off screen is where the pale white tone actually is because I didn't pull the palette down low enough to see it quite as clearly while filming. Oops. It's kind of hard for me to tell exactly what's in frame all the time when I'm filming. I really need to check my actual screen a bit more often. At any rate, I work in by doing the exact same thing I did for the first coat, but once I get a little of the way in, working wet and wet, I take these brown tones and start doing this coat. I know I'm going to be working in layers on top. When working with acrylic, remember, the more layers often the better it looks, so you have to think of things in layers and plan things out as you go along. I'm making sure to work things out so that the wet and wet effect will blur the edges ever so slightly but it won't be too blurred. I continue working with this process. As you can tell, the first layer of paint wasn't enough to completely cover the paint underneath. It was a good base coat, but it definitely needed a second coat. I'm working wet and wet here because it saves time and also because the base layer for the stripes would work quite well, a little bit blended in with the layers underneath. I make sure to get full coverage into all the nooks and crannies and I double check by looking underneath the model to make sure that any spots I missed the first time I got this time. I thought of a basic pattern of stripes with loops between and I worked along. Adding in a little burnt sienna, I can work more on the furniture. The back of this bookshelf hasn't had any paint put on it so I put a first coat on. I think it's okay to touch the wet paint a little bit while wearing gloves because I'm just painting wood grain texture, but I would advise trying to use a holder or something. I probably should really start considering using blue tack and the things I've been saving to put on the bottom of miniature models so I'm not actually touching where the wet paint is. I really need to start doing that as I go forward. I couldn't really do it with the Aranosaur, but I don't have as much of an excuse with these. If I just keep one side unpainted as I'm working. Still, I do have to try to paint all sides and it's a little hard to do that, so I'm trying to work things out. By using reddish browns in with these already mixed colors, I put a second coat over this. Now, I'm not as concerned with covering the original brown in the back of the shadows, like I said, but I'm using a darker tone intentionally in the shadowed areas and I'm using the slightly lighter tone in the areas that are lighter. In areas I think will be more exposed to light, I'm mixing a little more of the cream tone in to represent a light hitting the top of the surface, and I'm working wet in wet and just getting it all down. After all, these don't have to be the best painted things in the world to be pretty nice. Continuing on the Aranosaur the next day, I mixed up colors using some olive and sap green tones in order to add some greenishness there. A large mammal can't create a green pigment, but dinosaurs being related to birds could and of course including colors that would still help with camouflage but also would be very plausible for the animal I decided a little bit of a dulled down olive green with some brown added in would be very helpful I decided to have a stripe along the spine that fades more into a brownish tone as it goes up all the way along and I decided to darken all those base stripes with more dark brown tones, such as burnt umber. I'm trying to also make the animal visually pleasing and actually more beautiful in my eye, not purely 100% thinking just about what the most realistic thing is, but I believe this is quite a realistic and plausible situation. Skipping the part where I mixed the mouth color, I mix some shades of dull down brownish pink and a brighter pink and I paint the inside of the mouth here. Working things out, I'm making sure to lean my hand against the table underneath to stabilize things. Although sometimes things get a little wobbly, it's better to get a situation where things are stable as you're painting on a surface. I just block in a solid black dot for the eyes, which I'll put a little white highlight in without recording later. I use my darkest burnt umber mix to paint in the nail details. I decide to put nail details on the forepaws even though it is possible there were not physical nails on the fused together hoof like four feet. I still think it looks visually appealing so I decided to add them. Dry brushing on 
not too wet, a mix that includes a bit of white. I make a greenish brown mix to put in some subtle shading and speckling so that it's not quite a harsh transition between the striping and the body underneath and it's a little more broken apart and camouflaged. But I still want to see that cream color through everything so I don't exclusively make it too much of that green tone. I still want to see some of the cream coming through. I mix in extra white to make more of a highlight tone there and go over a few areas to add in painted in intentional extra highlighting as well as I'm working along this. Just to make sure I've painted on a certain amount of highlights to encourage the eye to notice such things, even though real highlights appear on the three-dimensional form. I mix this grayed down brown tone to add in intentionally painted shadows along the creases, which are meant to imply shadows cast by the light, but are painted on intentionally to enhance the look of this, despite the fact that real shadows are being cast. I mix two tones, a more white version and a darker version. And I work wet and wet, blending them together on the physical model so that there's a bit of a gradient. I put these in areas where there'd be darker shadows and folds and creases, including on the underside and on the inside of legs. This makes it a little more painterly than just painting a model and letting the normal light fall on it. So it gives a slightly different look, but I think it emphasizes certain things about the actual anatomy of the dinosaur and the way the light would hit it if it was a full-sized animal. Arenosaurus was discovered in the deserts of Niger in the early 1960s and is dated to the early Cretaceous period, 23 feet long or 7 meters. This was one of the most famous ornithopods due to the remarkably tall bony spines that were growing upwards from the vertebrae on its back which formed a sail. It could have also been formed in some sort of hump, but primarily it is agreed to have been some sort of sail, though the function of this sail is unknown. Most likely it was display or in controlling body temperature. Many other unrelated dinosaurs, such as Spinosaurus, also had sails like this. Small rounded horns in front of its eyes made Aranosaurus the only known horned ornithopod. Oranosaurus was a plant eater and had a small spiked thumb that was probably used in defense against predators. It was quite a beautiful animal that lived a long time ago. Once again, that's all for this video. If you like my videos, please remember to like, subscribe, and turn on that notification bell to all notifications so you will know when a new video comes up. I aim for new videos every Wednesday, but sometimes life happens and things are delayed. I hope that you enjoyed this video and we'll see you with another one very soon.